Stuart's A Bloody Reign is an evocation of the extraordinary era when these four Stuart kings lived through turbulent times. Catholic versus Protestant. Parliament against King. The English Civil War. Europe torn apart by religious conflict. The plague, the Great Fire of London. And finally, a Catholic king fled his country and his throne. Charles II finally came to the throne after years in exile following the execution of his father, Charles I, who had struggled to be the king that everyone longed for. The restoration would bring unity and glamour back to the country. The people were worn out by the austerity of Cromwell in the parliamentarian era, and they ecstatically welcomed the new king. People always say, oh gosh, Charles, he was so relaxed, you know, just interested in a luxurious life. But there was one part of him that was unforgiving, and that was his attitude towards those who had been involved in the death of his father. I've always thought that the key to understanding Charles II's reign is he spends 11 years just desperately wanting to be king. So once he becomes king, he doesn't want to do anything. In the reign of Charles II, you have the birth of modern times. Clever people who were literally rebuilding England. And then the fire in London, which enabled London to be rebuilt. It must have been so exciting uh, by the time you got to about 1700 to look around and find yourself in this spanking new city. In this series, we're examining the reigns of the Stuart Kings through the lives of the Wynne family here at Gwydir Castle in North Wales. The Wynnes had flourished during the reign of King James I and his son, King Charles I. Sir John Wynne, the patriarch of the family, had been knighted and honoured with a baronetcy. His son, Sir Richard Wynne, was a friend of King Charles I and had been appointed first gentleman of the bedchamber, as well as treasurer to the new queen. Henrietta Maria. But now, the situation had reached an all-time low for both the Stuarts and the Winds. Charles I was executed on the 30th of January, 1649. The Royalists had lost the Civil War. The reign of the Stuarts appeared over. The entire system of monarchy appeared over. In its place was now the Commonwealth, a new system of government where England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland were ruled over by Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector. The hero of the New Model Army is Oliver Cromwell, and he had a spectacular career. From the minute he gets into Parliament as the poorest man to make it to Parliament in 1640, he is a dynamo. I mean, he's a man totally committed to godly reformation, completely convinced of the fact that God has called him to some great cause. And he just rises from being a captain in 1642 and then becomes the Lieutenant General and the head of the cavalry for the New Model Army. Eventually, of course, the, the head of the whole army leading unparalleled the successful and brutal campaigns in Ireland and Scotland. After the execution of Charles I, his wife, Henrietta Maria, had to escape and found refuge in the French court. His son, Charles, attempted to muster forces in France and the Netherlands. They became royal prey. They were pursued out of the country. Henrietta Maria fled in a ship from the southwest to France under gunfire from Parliament. The future James II, as a young boy, managed to escape from Sion House uh, in Middlesex dressed as a girl and was spirited away to the Netherlands. And um, there was a little Princess Elizabeth who sadly sort of faded away and died in Carisbrook Castle in, in the Isle of Wight. Between 1646 and 51, the future Charles II endures a really humiliating exile. The story is that 
nobody dared tell Charles II that his father had been executed, and they didn't know what to do. So one of the senior courtiers went in to see Charles II, and instead of saying, Your Royal Highness, which would have been his title as prince, bowed and said, Your Majesty, meaning you are now the king. And Charles took a moment to understand it, but when he did, it was uh, an absolute body blow. The Wynne family at Gwydir Castle were deeply affected by the execution of Charles I. Sir Richard Wynne had lost both his king and his seat of parliament as he'd been expelled by the Pride's Purge of 1648, orchestrated by Oliver Cromwell. Sir Richard was heartbroken. He would never recover. And he died just a few months after King Charles was beheaded. Succeeding Sir Richard as the new head of the Wynne family would be his younger brother, Sir Owen Wynne. Owen was a very different character, bookish, endlessly intrigued by the possibilities of alchemy. It wasn't easy for poor old Sir Owen Wynne. He was the third son and he was the more bookish one. He wasn't the sort of glamorous courtier as his brother Richard had been. And so he was given all the kind of difficult jobs. He had to look after the estate for his brother. His brother gave him an allowance to do so. And he was at the brunt of it here during the Civil War. He and, of course, Lady Grace, his wife. So it can't have been easy during the Civil War, having all of this going on, being twice sacked, being seriously squeezed in terms of finances. Sir Owen had to be especially careful under this new Commonwealth. The Wynne family had been close to the deposed Royal House of Stuart, and there was a very real threat that the Wynne estate could be seized by force at any moment, just like royalist families up and down the country. Following the end of the English Civil War and the battles that occurred across Wales, Scotland and Ireland, known as the War of the Three Kingdoms, Oliver Cromwell had firmly established his grip on power. He'd been sworn in as Lord Protector in 1653 and drastically altered the cultural landscape of the country. Theatre was outlawed, celebration of Christmas and Easter was banned. For quite a lot of the 1650s, Oliver Cromwell is ruling England as Lord Protector, refusing to take the title of king, but very much like a king and his policy of, of promoting religious liberty, you know, does benefit a lot of people, including, of course, former Anglicans and even Catholics, who have a much easier time under Cromwell than they had under any of the Stuarts. If Cromwell had lived beyond his 60th birthday, the real possibility that the, the Stuart option might have faded away. In 1658, Oliver Cromwell fell ill and died and was succeeded by his son, Richard Cromwell. But Richard lacked any real authority, because if the position of Lord Protector could be inherited, so how was that any different from the monarchy? A power vacuum was developing, and the Booth Rebellion was one of several attempts to fill it. Sir George Booth was a former member of Parliament who organised an uprising against Richard Cromwell in 1659. Joining him in his efforts would be another former member of Parliament, Sir Thomas Middleton, and... Middleton's son-in-law, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger, son of Sir Owen. The Booth Rebellion had been planned in the regions near Gwydir Castle, North Wales, and the northwest of England. The forces assembled were able to take the important city of Chester. But although Cromwell's power was undoubtedly failing and the Commonwealth was weak, Booth Rebellion was still put down. Booth himself managed to escape capture dressed as a woman. But Sir Richard Wynne was not quite so fortunate. When Booth's revolt happens in 1659, it is Sir Thomas Middleton and Sir Richard Wynne. They are rising North Wales at the same time as George Booth is rising Cheshire. It was supposed to happen all over Britain. But the problem is, these were the only two areas that did rise, so the full weight of the New Model Army under General Lambert were there waiting for them, and they didn't stand a chance, as you can imagine. Um, Sir Richard Wynne is, is uh, caught in the uh, fallout of that. Obviously, he's one of the casualties of being mopped up, and uh, he's dragged off to Carnarvon Castle, uh, where he's a prisoner. Mm -hmm. 
I would have had you in the dungeon. Mother, I did not think to see you. My keeper permits me no letters. I've met the Colonel. He's a villain, is he not? I found him amenable. He is Parliament's creature. Courtesy will loosen a door rather than spite Richard. And a ready purse is more persuasive still. I think he will see you released. His expectation was to be courted. I'm in no mood for wooing. Perhaps you were enjoying your little game too much. There was a time to end this tyranny under which we live, Mother. If General Monk had joined but us. But he did not. He waited to see how the die would fall. Parliament and the army are in dispute. Our king may return, and our prayers rest upon that hope. But some new Lord Protector may rise in Cromwell's place. We have weathered this long darkness, a state and family intact. But you do not throw away your winter garb at the first bud of spring. Snows may return as quickly as they are banished. You were of no use to me here. Recall the habits of a courting youth and practice them upon the Colonel. My purse will do the rest. The failure of the Booth Rebellion, a terrible blow to Sir Richard Wynne the Younger and all royalists across the country. Even in its weakened state, Cromwell's Commonwealth had somehow hung on. But their disappointment wouldn't last for long. Across the English Channel, King Charles I's son and heir was patiently waiting in exile. Within a year, he'd be summoned back to London and a new Stuart King would be back on the throne. The Booth Rebellion of 1659 had failed to bring down the Commonwealth, but it hadn't been totally in vain. The actions of Sir George Booth, Sir Thomas Middleton, and Sir Richard Wynne the Younger had inspired another key figure of the era, George Monk, Governor of Scotland. Monk was a man of floating allegiance. At one point, he considered defending Richard Cromwell. Later, he thought of joining Booth's Rebellion. But now, in 1660, he was launching his own uprising. He led his army of loyal soldiers down from Scotland to London, and no one could stop him. He became the most powerful man in the country. But Monk was not in the mould of Oliver Cromwell. There would be no new Lord Protector. He made overtures to the Stuart family in exile. They were the only ones who could offer the country the stability it so desperately needed. General Monk realised that the mood in the country was fed up with Cromwell, fed up with the rule of the major generals. The army had stopped being on the side of the revolution. The army was reverting to the king. And once that happened, there was no hope of keeping Richard Cromwell. He didn't have any of his father's bullying strength. He was a quieter man. And anyway, there's something absurd if you've given up the concept of monarchy, thinking that there should be a hereditary protectorate. Even though the Great Rising didn't happen and it was put down, nevertheless, all eyes were on it. And at that moment, George Monk makes his move. And he could have been king, of course. And in fact, the throne was offered to him um, tentatively in, that, uh, in, in the way of him becoming the, the inheritor of the uh, protectorship. Uh, but wisely, he decided, no, it's much better to be the kingmaker than the king. So he is the, the grand choreographer who brings Charles back or enables uh, Charles to come back. Of course, Charles doesn't actually win back the throne. It's Parliament and the Commonwealth that lose it. They haven't got somebody to succeed Oliver Cromwell, who has the substance or the respect of both Parliament and the army to take his place. So it's really because of Oliver Cromwell's death and the inability of anyone following him to grab that power that eventually the English resort to default and think, well, we'll have a king back then. Charles had spent most of his exile in the Dutch city of Breda, and on the 4th of April, 1660, he issued the Declaration of Breda, promising a general pardon for crimes committed during the Civil War, recognition of property rights, religious toleration, and payment of army wage arrears. Four days later, the Parliament in London proclaimed Charles King. At once, 
the young exile made preparations in Europe to return home. Charles II and his advisers, they were convinced that uh, if there were conditions, they were going to be very onerous. And they'd be probably close to what Charles I had turned down before his trial and execution. But actually, the English Parliament had turned around on its head in just two months in early 1660. So although he has promised everything be settled by Parliament, he has returned unconditionally. I mean, Parliament passes a declaration that he has been king since the moment of the death of his father of royal memory. So they say, come back unconditionally, but thank you for your promise that you will accept any settlement we make on the most uh, neuralgic terms. Charles landed at Dover on May the 25th. He made his way to London, which he reached four days later. He had deliberately timed it, for he'd re-enter the city on his birthday. He was exactly 30 years old. The people of London were lining the streets. The crowds were so thick that it took seven hours to cross the still familiar city. Perhaps some of them had been there that cold January morning, more than a decade earlier, when the king's father had been beheaded in Whitehall. Now they were cheering the return of the Stuarts. Charles II had come home to claim his crown. So great a multitude. And in so merry a spirit too holding the king's picture aloft that was near a hanging matter but weeks ago. It must be all of London. We shall know of his coming from the crowd. They line the streets like this from Dover to Whitehall. In all the years of Cromwell, did you ever see such a thing? No. Nor can I remember when last we two had an afternoon of leisure such as this. He will be a fine king, I'm sure of it. Despite the general pardon offered by Charles in his declaration at Breda, not every crime was forgotten. Fifty people were deliberately excluded from Charles's acts of forgiveness. Nine men who'd signed his father's death warrant were executed. The identity of the executioner who actually carried out the beheading of King Charles I is still a mystery to this day. As for Oliver Cromwell, the man who usurped Charles's father, even after death, he would be held accountable as would the judge who oversaw Charles's trial, John Bradshaw, and Henry Ireton, who'd signed the King's death warrant. The three of them were removed from their graves and hung up for the crowds to witness before they were all decapitated and their heads placed on spikes. There was one part of him that was unforgiving, and that was his attitude towards those who had been involved in the death of his father. And that's the 59 men who signed the death warrant and another 20 or so who were either legal officers in the court case or on the scaffold at the execution. And Charles's hatred for them never ended. The people he most blames for his father's death, their heads were cut off and their bodies thrown into a lime pit and the heads stuck on spikes on the Palace of Westminster. I think he just adored his father and couldn't believe that these people could expect any sort of sympathy at all. And there was also an underlying point too, that if he had been soft with them, what would it have said about him as a, as a, as a monarch? So I think that there was a cold part of Charles II and it was absolutely focused on those who had killed his father. Life would change drastically with the return of the king. Puritan repression was lifted almost at once. A new age of liberty and even debauchery took hold. Amid a dazzling cultural rebirth, poetry and the arts would prosper. Theatres reopened with women appearing on stage for the first time. The sciences flourished as well, with luminaries such as Sir Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle, expanding the horizons of human knowledge. I think there was an enormous mood of optimism when Charles II came back, partly because he did this clever thing. He was prepared to tolerate an awful lot of people who had supported the Civil War. And therefore, because he was a genial uh, person on some, on some levels, and certainly politically very intelligent, um, 
he was able to create an atmosphere in which political reconciliation could happen. Charles is very keen to work with as many people who'd worked with Cromwell as possible. He wants to see healing and settling. His former enemies were much more likely to send him on his travels again than his former friends. He'd rather disappoint his friends than his enemies because his aim is not to have to go away again. Charles himself will be the founder of the Royal Observatory, which you can see here in this painting from its earliest days. He had an interest in the burgeoning field of natural sciences, and he would grant a charter to the Royal Society. Sir Owen Wynne would not get to see much of the Restoration. He died in the same year as King Charles II was crowned. The period that Sir Owen Wynne had lived under so cautiously in the last years of his life was now called the Interregnum. Sir Owen's son, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger, freshly released from Carnarvon Castle, inherited the Wynne estate. Sir Richard Wynne's uncle had been such a key figure in the court of Charles I. There was no reason to believe that the Wynne family would not prosper once again, now that the Stuarts were back. King Charles II was finally on the throne, and he needed a queen. During the reign of King Charles I, there had been negotiations with the royal family of Portugal for the hand of Catherine of Braganza. This arrangement had been put on permanent hold thanks to Oliver Cromwell, but it was brought back to life following the Restoration. King Charles II married Catherine of Braganza in 1662 and a nation of tea drinkers was born. Catherine brought over the custom of tea drinking from Portugal and it quickly became popular amongst the aristocracy in the reign of King Charles II. Sir Richard Wynne the Younger would be a key part of this restored royal court, taking up the position of Chamberlain to Charles's new queen. A delighted nation dubbed the new king the Merry Monarch. But just like his father, Charles had married a Catholic, and the religious difficulties that had so blighted the past did not simply disappear. However, there were far more pressing problems just around the corner. The worst outbreak of plague since the Black Death and the Great Fire of London. Your fire was dying. Lady Grace, let me summon the maid. I have brought it back to life. It is quite all right. I can manage a fire. Sit. I thought I heard the footpost not long ago. Yet I know that cannot be. I forbade the London Post from approaching our gates, and none would be so disrespectful as to disobey my wishes. Do not blame the poor man. No, I do not. You commanded him and he obeyed as he should. I had not heard from Richard in so very long. He lives then. The existence of the letter was all you needed to know that. I fear it is very bad this time. I remember the plague in 1625. I was younger than you, not long married. Old Sir John kept carts of London cloth outside for days at a time, happier as he was to see his finest purchases ruined than risk plague within our walls. It must be destroyed. It is one letter. Let us pass through what hands and what parts of the country we know not. Every moment it is in this house, the danger deepens. I will have it removed from you if I must. 
1665, the Great Plague of London hit the city. There had been large outbreaks throughout the 17th century, particularly in 1625 and 1636, but nothing as bad as this. It would be the last major outbreak of the disease to occur in England. A quarter of the population of the capital died in little over a year. Plague had been something they'd all lived with forever. It's something that they were pretty wised up to. And there are accounts of bolts of cloth, for example, being sent up from London, which would be kept outside the gates of Gwydda for up to two weeks. So the carters would not be allowed into the, uh, the, main, the great court. Uh, they'd be kept outside by the porter, and they would observe for two weeks. They knew that one thing was certain. If you have an infected cargo that came into somewhere like Gwydda, the house would get it. King Charles II and the family escaped to Salisbury and England's parliament relocated to Oxford. By the spring of 1666, the outbreak had died down and it was deemed safe for the Stuarts to return to London. But just as life was returning to normal, yet another disaster unfolded. The Great Fire of London broke out on the 2nd of September, 1666. What began in a Pudding Lane bakery spread out of control and burned for three days straight. The fires gutted the medieval heart of the city and the ancient St. Paul's Cathedral was utterly destroyed. Fears abounded that the fire was a foreign plot and King Charles II worried that the entire city might fall into anarchy. England was at war with the Netherlands at the time. The Dutch saw the fire as a divine retribution for the actions of the English Navy and Rear Admiral Robert Holmes, who'd set the town of West Telleshing ablaze in what became known as Holmes's Bonfire. The disasters that befell Charles, the hammer blow of the plague, the fire, the wars with the Dutch. Meanwhile, the people of England were predominantly in favor of the Dutch, so he was out of kilter with the political feeling of, 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 his, uh, of his parliament for a lot of his reign. These were terrible things because the mentality of the time was somehow that the, the monarch was responsible for life, for everyday life. King Charles II was facing battles on all fronts, just like the Stuart kings who'd come before him. His capital burned to the ground, the economy in the doldrums. The only reason why he'd gone to war in the first place was to try to help the economy. The Dutch Republic was in the midst of its golden age, lucrative trade routes across the globe. Charles's younger brother, James, had suggested they seize lucrative colonial possessions from the Dutch, disrupt their trading dominance. Charles agreed he was keen for a popular war to boost his standing. The war was not a success. The Netherlands may have been a smaller nation, but it had a far superior navy and much more money. Disasters such as the Great Fire of London further sapped England's ability to prosecute the war. By 1667, the Dutch controlled much of the waters around the south of England. They'd secured pivotal European alliances, and that June, they staged a devastatingly bold naval assault, dubbed the raid on the Medway. They attacked the English fleet at anchor in the mouth of the Thames. Many ships were destroyed, and it remains one of the greatest disasters in the history of the Royal Navy. Charles, crushed, had to sue for peace. Royal Oak burned, the Loyal London and the Royal James too. The flagship carried off without a single shot fired in her defence. I thought the Dutch are much lesser power than England. We are the more numerous, but they are richer, and they have directed their wealth with far greater wisdom. Since the last war, they've rebuilt their navy and plain made expert study of river navigation and warfare. And what have we done? beggared our garrisons with masks and courtly merriments. I have no place there. Then be done with London. Go not there again. 
the pride and pomp and luxury. All the jails of England hold no more cunning a collection of thieves than court. They never leave off robbing his majesty. Even his dogs are target for pilfering. It was thought the Dutch could not even set out a fleet this year. It will have to be peace, or the kingdom whole may be undone. The treaty ending the war was signed in 1667 in the town of Breda, where Charles had made his famous declaration that allowed him to return to the English throne several years earlier. Charles was humiliated, but it did at least bring the war to an end and allow London to be rebuilt. Charles encouraged the greatest architects to come forward with radical plans for the city. Had these been realized, London today would be a completely different place. But in the end, practicalities, money, meant most of the city was rebuilt on the same plan as before. But the buildings themselves were much changed. Here, the genius of Sir Christopher Wren did have the opportunity to shine, and his designs remain some of the most famous in the London skyline. It was, there was a sense of a new beginning, but a new beginning not out of total novelty, but out, out of something that was old. All sorts of exciting things happened during the Restoration and then as it unfolded the full reign of Charles II, the birth of the Royal Society, figures like Boyle, figures like Christopher Wren, clever people who were scientists, who were architects, who were literally rebuilding England. And then the rather good luck, as it happened, of the fire, which enabled London to be rebuilt and gloriously rebuilt. It must have been so exciting to look around and find yourself in this spanking new city with so many absolutely mind-bogglingly beautiful buildings all around you on a, a River Thames which was crammed with uh, ships, commerce, entertainment, theatres. Uh, it really was bliss to be alive, I think, in the reign of Charles II. As King Charles arranged for his city to be rebuilt, he was also building up the forces for another battle with the Dutch Republic that had so humiliated him. In secret, a new alliance was forged with Louis XIV of France. Together, they take on the Dutch. In 1670, King Charles II made a monumental decision. He signed a secret agreement with the French known as the Treaty of Dover. Charles had been humiliated by a loss to the Dutch Republic three years earlier. He was determined to gain revenge by joining forces with France to conquer the Dutch. But one of the provisos of the pact was that Charles would convert to Catholicism. Charles was playing with fire. Perhaps the thing which historians are most divided about over Charles II is what on earth he was doing in the Treaty of Dover when he told Louis XIV that he would become a Catholic if Louis would give him the money, the money and the troops to make good his claim. Now, there are plenty of people who think that he's being too clever by half, that he's simply using this as a device to get Louis to believe him and give him other things. I've always been inclined to think that Charles always yearns to become a Catholic, that for most of his reign, he can see that it'll be, it will be very dangerous, that he will cause a huge amount of political reaction. But there's a point around then uh, when you know, he's under such pressure from his Catholic wife, his Catholic mistress, and there's just a moment at which he thinks everywhere in Europe where monarchy is strong, Catholicism is strong. Catholics have been the people who have been my most loyal supporters. It, but for the Catholics, I would not have escaped after the Battle of Worcester. It was the Catholics who risked their lives to hide me, and get me out of the country. And they, it's just possible that he went through a, a moment when he thought, I wonder if I can get away with becoming a Catholic. England was still fiercely divided by religion. A Catholic king would rip open old wounds. In March 1672, Charles made the first moves towards fulfilling part of the secret deal with King Louis XIV of France by making the Royal Declaration of Indulgence. It promised religious toleration for all, including Catholics, 
and seemed to be a first step towards some kind of reconciliation between England and Rome following the great break of Henry VIII's reign. You seek stained glass for the new chapel. I shall not ask how you came by such intelligence, lest you implicate the walls and doors of my chamber. I had thought it an art lost in this country. There are men in Paris who preserve the skill. Why not Rome? The king has declared indulgence on matters of religion. And parliament? I care not. Is his declaration even legal? I care not. I have an image in my mind, mother. The chapel shall not be complete without it. It is a cross, a fine cross. I must have it. It was working too long of a day that took your father ill. It is not that. Oh, yes, you must. Mother, it is not that. We shall consult physicians. I have. The outward applications having proved unsuccessful, they now prescribe inward medicines. And what course do they predict? I must have that glass, Mother. After the Declaration of Indulgence, uh, things become obviously much easier for uh, not just Catholics, but, but crypto-Catholics. We don't know precisely uh, where Sir Richard Wynne the Younger stood on this, um, but we know that he's the Chamberlain of Queen Catherine of Braganza. And we know that he's trying to get a stained glass cross for the new chapel he's building in 1673 to 4. If you look at the chapel, you would think it was a Catholic chapel, actually. In April 1672, just a month after the Royal Declaration of Indulgence, England and France declared war on the Netherlands. It did not go according to plan. The money promised by France to Charles was not enough to cover the military expenses. The king was forced to recall Parliament, and it contained many members who were fiercely opposed to the royal declaration. They deemed it far too generous to Catholics, and they now had the king in a bind. Parliament refused to fund the war until the declaration was withdrawn. Charles had to comply. But worse was to come for the king. The details of his secret pact with Louis XIV were leaked. The public was furious. Charles quickly realized that to defend his own position, he had to pull out of the alliance with France, end the war with the Netherlands. In early 1674, the Treaty of Westminster was signed, which brought peace between England and the Netherlands. The war had achieved precisely nothing. Fortunately, the full details of what he'd agreed to never did come out, but it clearly helps to build the climate of anxiety in the 1670s about whether there is a drift back towards Catholic monarchy. There was still a lot of political tensions and the constant question of if Charles couldn't produce a legitimate heir with Catherine of Braganza, who was going to succeed? And then the realization that his brother, James, Duke of York, was a Roman Catholic. Was, it led to a, a flaring up of intense anti-Catholic um, feeling. Uh, and part of that was driven by a, a wish to make sure that James could not become uh, the future King of England. So all in all, I think um, Charles II would have preferred a much quieter time than he was handed. also saw the death of Sir Richard Wynne the Younger. He'd been a member of Parliament for a total of 20 years, both before and after the interregnum. Without any male heirs, the Wynne estate passed to his daughter Mary, but his title of baronet would be given to his cousin, John Wynne. The strength of the Wynne family seemed to be dissipating. Charles II had returned to England, and so many across the country had had such high hopes but his reign was turning out to be a disappointment. Just like the winds, the Stuarts were losing power. Despite having many children with his numerous mistresses, King Charles had no legitimate heirs with his wife, Catherine of Braganza, nor would any be born in the remaining 11 years of his life. The heir apparent throughout was his younger brother, James, 
Many suspected that James was a Catholic. They were right. In fact, Charles II himself converted to the Catholic religion on his deathbed. He became incredibly ill in February 1685, very, very quickly, and suddenly he had a massive seizure. And then, poor man, he was handed over to the combined ignorance of the royal physicians who did not know what to do. And they took a view that the best thing they could do was stimulate him and get his whole energy pulsing through him, I suppose. So they shaved off his hair and applied white hot glass to his scalp. They put a sort of acid in his nostrils. They pumped him full of laxatives and enemas. And they gave him tonics of ground up man's skull and put poultices of pigeon droppings on his feet. And although occasionally, bizarrely, he seemed to be getting better, the general flow was towards death. And one of his mistresses, Louise de Carraway, took James, Duke of York, the king's brother, aside and said, look, please don't tell anyone I've said this, but his one wish has always been that he dies a Catholic. The evidence that Charles II converted on his deathbed is, in the end, the testimony of the tiny number of people who are witnesses to it. It, it is very widely accepted that it, it, that it was so. The man who was, is supposed to have received him into the church was someone who had helped him during his escape after Worcester in 1651 and had been, in that sense, someone he trusted for many years. And for me, at any rate, it is the logical outcome. Out of the shadows, James brings a man called Father Huddleston who had helped Charles survive during his six weeks on the run after the Battle of Worcester. And James utters the immortal line of, Sire, I bring you now a man who once saved your life, and now he'll save your soul. And Huddleston sits with the king and takes him through the various processes to bring him to Catholicism, uh, including what I'd imagine was rather a long confession by Charles. And he dies the following day, having just reconnected briefly with the six weeks in his life of which he was most proud when he had shown himself to be brave and resilient. If anyone thought that the controversial issue of religious tolerance had gone away, they were mistaken. The reign of James II would bring with it another crisis in England and another war. In the next episode of The Stuarts of Bloody Reign, we see how the committed Catholic James II ascends to the throne of England, succeeding his brother. What had seemed an impossibility decades earlier was now a reality. The religious tensions across the British Isles reached fever pitch, and they would test the loyalties of the Wynne family at Gwydir Castle in their relationship with the House of Stuart. All across the country, plans were made to usurp the Catholic king. But the real danger lay very close to home. James's own daughter Mary and her husband, the Protestant William of Orange of the Dutch Republic, were the greatest threat of all. This would spell the end of the House of Stuart and the beginning of the glorious revolution.